to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Let's start at verse 25. And I'm reading here out of the New Amplified Bible, which may read a little differently than the old one or than some versions you have, but that's a good thing. Luke 14, verse 25. Now, large crowds were going along with Jesus. Let me stop right there. You know, we have an idea that everything's bigger in Texas, right? And that bigger is better. But there's a slogan out there that less is more. And I think we all understand that quality is better than quantity that when there is an overabundance supply of something, that that makes the value of each one of those things go down. And that when there is scarcity, uh, the value of those things goes up. Now, let me say, the church, at least in America, the church seems to have two different visions or two different methods of how to, uh, to be the church, how to function as the body of Christ in this world. And neither one of them are wrong. But one of them certainly seems to have more followers than the other version or the other method. The, the, the standard method of Christian growth, t Christian teaching, is evangelism. It's the, the, the great commission is go out and get people saved. And then the church will grow numerically because the people in the church are going out and witnessing and they're, they're getting their loved ones and friends and neighbors saved. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, God's not willing that any should perish. Okay, so, so evangelism is important. But there is a difference between being saved and being a disciple. Now, this is something the church doesn't necessarily even agree with. What I'm saying is we're going to talk about being a disciple today. And to a lot of the church, well, if you're saved, you're a disciple. And if you're not a disciple, you're not saved. Well, clearly, you have to be saved to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But you can be saved and not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about this today. And God is looking for disciples. And the discipleship method or uh, vision, if you want to put it that way, is not just, okay, you get saved and then go out and get somebody else saved. The disciple message is one of being transformed into the image of Jesus. Now, that can devolve into something that is so ingrown and so introverted and so much navel-gazing that it becomes mm, clannish, okay? So there are extremes on either side that God doesn't want his people in. And clearly, we here at Romans 8, from the first time I came anyway, have been focused on the business of being transformed into the image of Jesus. And we've not, been, we've not made a big priority of, of going out and getting people saved. I mean, first of all, that's the Holy Spirit's job. And the truth of the matter is, if you're not being transformed into the image of Jesus and you go out and call people and try to get them to become a Christian, if they look at your life and they don't see Jesus, they're probably not going to be interested in having what you have. So being transformed is one of the best tools of witnessing there is. Now, let me say, being small, there's nothing necessarily good about being small. And Romans 8 has gotten so small to the point that, uh, you know, our resources are dwindling by the day. And at some point, 
perhaps even next year, we will be out of money. And I'm not asking you, well, you know, fork it over. <clears throat> I'm just saying that, that growth is not a bad thing. But we're not just talking about numeric growth. We're talking about spiritual growth. Okay, so keep that in mind as we talk about what we're going to talk about today. A crowd, the word crowd or multitude as it is in uh, King James, literally means a mob, a, a rabble or a riot. Um, so being part of a crowd, see there, people think there's, there's safety in a crowd. Well tell that to the folks on January 6th in Washington DC. There's not always safety in a crowd. And sometimes once the crowd starts moving somewhere, it moves you along with it, and it's going somewhere you don't want to go. Large crowds <coughs> were going along with Jesus. Well, you know what? Those are the same people that once Jesus became an enemy of the state, they weren't going along with Jesus anymore. They were shouting, crucify him. Right? So just feeling like, well, I'm safe as long as I'm part of the, the Christian collective. You're not. You know, it's funny how, how much things change. The more they change, the more they remain the same. You know, the way, the way it's going now in the body of Christ in the world is the way it was going back then. Okay, let me keep going. Large crowds were going along with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, and they had come to him, right? They're going along with him. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother or wife or children or brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, of course, he's not telling you to be uh, you know, mean-spirited towards your loved ones. I mean, the rest of the New Testament tells you, you know, you should love your, your neighbor as yourself, and you should love your parents, and you should love your ch children. And, you know, by, by this they'll know you're my disciples because you love one another. It appears he's contradicting that here. Well, now, I like what the Amplified says in the brackets here. <clears throat> it says you should hate in the sense of indifference to a relative disregard for them in comparison with your attitude toward God. Okay, that's good. But I would add to this. I would add to it this. Being, uh, being who we are is the product of our culture. It's a product of who we associate with. It's a product of how we were raised. It's a product, you know, you're talking about sweet tea, okay? Or, or, and in the South, it's like, well, you know, that's, that's your own life. Your own life is, is, you know, where you come from and who you are with. And what, what Jesus is saying here is that is the old man. And Jesus said he wants us to become new creatures. So if, if you just, well, hey, this is just the way I am, to lock it or lump it, well, then you don't hate yourself. You hate yourself when it's like, you know, yeah, I do this, and, and yeah, everybody in my family does that, but you know what? That's not Jesus. You know, yeah, I throw temper tantrums, but that's not Jesus. You know, so, so hate that. Or like, well, everybody in my family drank alcohol, so it must be okay for me to drink alcohol. Well, no. Maybe your brother or your father or your mother or whoever did, but just because they did, that doesn't make it right for you. You should hate that if God says, hey, don't do that. That's what he's saying here, right? And he said, unless you do that, unless you're willing to move out of what situation normal comfort zone is, you're not his disciple. He didn't say you couldn't be saved. This is my point. You can be saved and be just like your father or just continue, well, it's just the way I am. And I remember when I was in the Baptist Student Union training to be a summer missionary at the Grand Canyon National Park. And we went to a leadership training conference and there was one guy sitting on his bunk bed and he was uh, dipping snuff. And he said, you know what? I'm probably going to carry this old habit to my grave. 
And back then, I didn't know you, there was a demon and you could cast it out. But, you know, he loved Jesus. You know, it's like an old cow chewing his cud, you know. It's like... One of the problems in, in evangelism in the world today is the church sometimes thinks they have to become like the world to attract people to Jesus. So, well, they didn't go and they don't they attract people to Jesus. I don't think so. Because he's looking for a disciple. That word disciple means, basically means a student. Well, a student of who? A student of Jesus. Keep the place here. Go to Luke chapter 6. We're all students of Jesus. You know, that's another thing. There are too many people in the body of Christ think, and Steve talked about this Friday night, we have our heroes. We think, well, if I'll just be like Owen Cain or I'll be like Brother So-and-so, then I'll be, that's what God wants. Well, that may be a place to start, okay? But what Jesus said about it in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, he said, A student is not superior to his teacher, but everyone when he is completely trained will be like his teacher. And Jesus is our teacher. And if we will continue to be his student, his disciple, that I think in the King James, instead of the word student, they use the word disciple. So that's, that's how you could be saved and not be a disciple. Is you can be saved, you know, you can, be, you can believe Jesus died for your sins and if you die you go to heaven like that vast host that Steve was talking about. But if you're not in the school of transformation by the word of God, you're not his disciple. Okay, and then here's what he, some more what he says about discipleship. Verse 27, he says, Whoever does not carry his own cross and follow after me cannot be my disciple. Again, I like what the Amplified says in the brackets about what that means. He said to express a willingness to endure whatever may come and to believe in Jesus, conforming to his example in living, and if need be, in suffering or perhaps dying because of the faith in him. There are Christians in this world that are doing that. And that thing Steve said this morning about how the time will come when Christians don't know the difference between the two witnesses and the two beasts, what does that tell you? Yeah. It, it tells you that, that the herd, the, the large crowd, right. has gotten right. uh, pushed in a direction that's wrong. We don't want that. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about the battle for truth. This is what we're going to try to understand this so that that doesn't happen to us. Okay. He said, uh, you've got to carry your cross. You've got, to, you've got to realize this requires something of you beyond the norm. Okay? This, this requires some, some diligence. This requires commitment. Again, I've, I've heard about commitment from the first sermon I ever heard at Romans 8. And that's not necessarily what evangelists preach to the world. They, they don't say, hey, you know, you're going to have to die to yourself to be a Christian. They don't, they don't preach that. They kind of say, hey, doesn't matter what you've done, Jesus loves you. Come to Jesus. Okay, you got to come to Jesus before being told you got to die to yourself makes any sense at all. I get that. But go, go on, verse 28. It says, for which one of you, when he wants to build a watchtower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to finish it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is unable to finish the building 
all who see it will begin to ridicule him saying, well, this man began to build and was not able to finish it. Man, is that not a picture of the body of Christ? That, that the foundation is laid. The foundation of their salvation through the blood of Jesus is laid. But then the building of them, them becoming transformed into the image of Jesus doesn't happen. And, you know, they fall away. They, they go back into their old ways or whatever. And their, their friends and the people that they're trying to witness to say, Oh, yeah, you're, you're a Christian? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I really believe that. Hey, I know what I'm talking about. That's happened to me a couple of times in my life. Well, I made a start with Jesus, and then I kind of said, oh yeah, Ray's going through, he, he went through his religious phase back then, now he's going through his uh, hippie phase now, or, or something like that, right? Well, that's what's happening here. Because I was not a disciple. Verse 31, or what king, when he said, 31, same chapter I was in. 14. Okay, I was still in the Ah, well, same book anyway. <laughs> All right. Okay, yeah, verse 31. What king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one who is coming against him with 20,000. That, friends, is a picture of the church of Jesus Christ in this world today. We are not the most uh, numerous people on planet Earth. And the bad guys are getting, they're, they're mobilizing for battle. I mean, they're mobilizing to take over the world's governments, the world's religions, the world's economic systems, etc. And they're dedicated. They're doing it. Uh, they're engaged. And so in the natural, they outnumber us. So if all we could depend upon was self and just who we are, you know, like I was talking about our culture and, well, you know, just, just the way I am. Well, just the way we are is not enough to defeat the devil. I'm sorry, it's, it's not. Because he's supernatural and just the way we are in the flesh is not supernatural. It's natural. The natural is not going to defeat the supernatural. It takes one kind of supernatural to defeat another kind of supernatural. And this is what he's saying. He says... Uh, verse 32, he says, or else, if he's not powerful enough, while the other king is still a far distance away, he sends an envoy and asks for terms of peace. Well, the church has been doing that. The church has been just writing off uh, spiritual warfare. And they say, oh, well, you know, we don't have to do that. Jesus, Jesus did it for us. And so when the devil comes along and makes it, I'm going to make an offer that you can't refuse. Well, they take the offer. Verse 33. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not carefully consider the cost and then forsake, for my sake, give up all of his possessions. Now, of course, there was that story about the rich young ruler, and God actually, I mean, Jesus actually told him, give away your money and, and you know, follow me. I think there's a bigger picture than, than to try to just nail that down to specific material possessions. Giving up all that you have, again, goes back to that, well, who are you anyway? Who are you in the flesh? You know, how do you, what is your identity in this world? Well, he's saying, lay that on the altar. You know, make that not as important as who Jesus says we are and what he is doing in our lives. Go with that instead of what your natural inclination would be. 
That, that's what he's asking of us if you're going to be his disciples. And my point here with this series of messages is for us to be his disciples means we have to be spiritual warriors. It is a battle. It, th this is not a time where we can sit comfortably uh, within, the, within the flock and, and be happy. I'm not saying you can't be happy as a warrior, but you're happy as a warrior when you win, <laughs> right? You're not happy as a warrior when you lose. And the body of Christ loses all the time, okay? So, I mean, okay, God can turn our worst defeats into victories. God can do it. And that's something to rejoice about. But if you're in the process of losing, you shouldn't be, oh, well, glory, hallelujah, anyway. No, that's not, the, that's not the path to victory. You know, the path to victory would be like what Jehoshaphat did when all the enemies were coming against them, the Moabites and the Edomites and all the other ites. And he was saying, hey, God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And then he gives the answer. And then you can go out and sing, uh, praise ye the Lord for his mercy endures forever. But I, I don't recommend you do that until God, until you cry out to God and he gives you the answer. Okay? Otherwise, you might just be blowing the whole thing off. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 4. See, I'm putting 2 Timothy 2 verse 4 together with Luke 14 verse 43 where it says, No soldier in active service gets entangled in the ordinary business affairs of civilian life. He avoids them so that he may please the one who has enlisted him to serve. What that means for us is that there are some things more important than our satisfaction and comfort and happiness in this life. There are some things more important than uh, our prosperity. There are some things more important than our peace and security or comfort. I'm not saying God is not interested. I mean, all, most all of the epistles that Paul start off with, grace and peace to you. Okay, so there is grace and there is peace. And, and, and God wants us to have it. But there are some things more important than us having grace and peace. Oh, why are they? Well, that's what we're talking about in this message, okay? What's more important? Well, how about truth? Well, why are you saying that? Well, okay, why am I saying that? Keep the place here. Go to John, chapter 1. When I get done in John, I'll try to remind you to go back to 2 Timothy. Okay, John chapter 1, of course verse 16 does tell us that God's got some good things for us, okay? For John 1, 16 says, for out of his fullness we, we have all received grace upon grace, Spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, favor upon favor, and gift upon gift. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Okay, so grace is not the only thing Jesus brings to us. Jesus brings to us truth. And remember, when, when uh, he identified himself with abstract words. What were the three abstract words he described himself as? The way, 
that means he is revealing to us a, a journey. It, it, it's not just a one-time experience. See, this is another thing I think the church kind of doesn't really get right sometimes is that it's not just okay you go down and pray a prayer you walk down an aisle or you go down and get hands laid on you or this or that and then you got it well you got started okay and you got to start somewhere so i'm not saying don't do all of that but that's not the end of the story that's just the beginning it's a way jesus has for us a way and then the last one is which life in him is life okay he, so, outside of him, you don't have life. You just have existence, survival. Okay, but then the one in the middle, truth. If you don't have truth, you don't, the, what, what is being given to you as grace is a perverted thing. Okay, go back to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. So you, my son... Be strong, strengthened, and empowered in the grace that is to be found only in Jesus Christ. What does that tell you about His grace? His grace is something we need to be strong. Well, why do we even need to be strong? I mean, Paul said, well, it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. That's a different, that, but we'll get to that in another message, okay? We need to be strong in order to stand against the stuff that's coming at us. Well, I'll let, the, I'll let the Word tell you that. Keep the place here in 2 Timothy. Go to Ephesians. I know you know this. Ephesians chapter 6. Why do you need to be strong? Ephesians 6, verse 10. In conclusion, be strong. There it is again. Be strong. Draw your strength from Him. Be empowered through your union with Him in the power which He provides. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to successfully stand against the schemes, strategies, and deceits of the devil. So what does it sound like the battle is? A battle for truth. And your enemy is coming at you with what? Schemes, strategies, and deceits. Okay? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against rulers, powers, world forces of this present darkness against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural sphere. Therefore, put on God's complete armor so that you may be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger. And having done everything that the crisis demands to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious, Okay, and then he tells this uh, metaphor about the, the, uh, the ancient soldier and what all they were equipped with. And, of course, now armies are equipped with maybe some different equipment than they were back then. But I want you to see what the first thing that he mentioned here. Stand firm and hold your ground, having tightened the wide band of truth around your waist. This is some interesting uh, words here. The wide band, of course, is a belt. When I go running, I have a thing called fanny pack. <laughs> but, but it straps around. It's not just, just, you know, I mean, I've got, you could say, well, this, this, uh, cordless microphone has a fanny pack or some kind of thing here, a power pack. But a fanny pack, I have to have, it has to strap around me and then buckle in the front. Otherwise, it, it's heavy. You know, I put my cell phone in there. I put my, my wallet if I need to, uh, my keys to my car. You know, it, it carries a lot of stuff. 
but it, it, I have to strap it on, you see. Okay, and he's saying, truth, you have to strap it on. It, you can't just stick that in your pocket and go off with it. You have to, you have to strap it on. It's a belt. Uh, and, and that word actually it means, in, in Greek, it means a, a yoke or a coupling, a connection, or even an obligation. See, if you have truth, it obligates you to live according to that truth. And we know from the first chapter of Romans that everybody has a conscience. And that means that everybody, when they're doing wrong, when, when, they, do deli when they give in to the devil, there, there's a red flag that, that goes off inside of them saying, no, don't do that. And they push that aside. And of course it says also in another place in the New Testament that after you kind of make a habit of, of doing that, of pushing your conscience aside, that conscience becomes uh, encrusted. It becomes seared, I think. It's like a, you know, a piece of meat on a, on a skillet. If you leave it on the hot skillet long enough, it starts turning black and it gets kind of hard and crusty. Which, you know, if you're out having a camp out, that can be kind of cool, but you don't want to do that in your kitchen or it'll fill the house with smoke, right? Well, we don't want our conscience to be seared. Okay, so we, we've, got to, um, we've got to obligate ourselves to the truth. Well, what is the truth? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. But go on. It says that that wide band of truth is around your waist. Well, in the King James, that word waist is your loins. In the Bible, that has a lot of meaning besides just a certain part of your body. The loins is often a, uh, a euphemism for your reproductive organs, okay, which is in your midsection. But, but your reproductive organs, by definition, reproduce. Okay, so how do we, what are we talking about within a context of Christianity? What are we talking about? We're talking about reproducing your life uh, in others. Wit your witness. You're leading other people to Jesus. You're, um, the, the, you're, you're letting Jesus be reproduced in you. How does that happen? With truth. Not with emotion. Not with... Tradition, not with uh, form and ceremony, not with uh, lights and action and music. It's with truth. So if the church is putting something else out there and it's not true, then what's being reproduced is not Jesus. Okay. Go to back to Second Timothy chapter two. Verse two. So the things which you have heard me teach in the presence of many witnesses, entrust as a treasure to reliable and faithful men who will be capable and qualified to teach others. Well, see, there's reproduction. That, that's reproducing truth right there, see? The, the truth that you have received, then share that. And again, that is really just the evangelical model. I mean, that's, that's you know, the Great Commission in a sense. But it's more than just, well, go out and tell people Jesus loves them or go out and have them pray the sinner's prayer with you. What have you been taught? I think in the brackets here in the, this version of the Amplified, it says the, the doctrine, precepts, admonitions, and some of the ministry, the, some, S-U-M, of the ministry, which you have heard from me, teach and entrust to faithful men. Teach others. Share with others what you have learned. And you know, it is going to sound strange to a lot of them, 
Just like it sounded strange to you. <laughs> Just like when, when uh, you know, Doug Shirley said to Steve Jordan, well, there's no other name but Jesus whereby you must be saved. It's like he wasn't hearing that, you know, in his world. Steve wasn't. Well, there's things you're going to tell people they haven't been hearing in their world. But the thing is, this is, this is our assignment as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Let me give you that. Keep the place here, 2 Timothy. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. In fact, to the degree that we don't take that seriously, we do not grow, both as a church and as individuals. Hebrews chapter 5, verse uh, 11. <clears throat> Concerning this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull and sluggish in your spiritual hearing and disinclined to listen. Now, folks, I'm not saying this about you all, but I am saying this about uh, the Church of Jesus Christ in general is thoroughly populated with those who are disinclined to listen. For though by this time you ought to be teaching others, you actually need someone to teach you again the elementary principles of God's Word. You've come to be spiritually or continually in need of milk and not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk um, is doctrinally inexperienced. I like the way the, the, this version puts it, to be doctrinally inexperienced. That describes the, the body of Christ in America pretty well, I would say. They are doctrinally inexperienced. It doesn't say they're, they're you know, uh, counterfeit Christians. It just says that what they know about Christian doctrine is, is rather minimal. It's doctrinally inexperienced and unskilled in the word of righteousness. A spiritual infant. Solid food is for the spiritually mature whose senses are trained by practice to distinguish between what is good and what is evil. Mark chapter 4. We'll get back to 2 Timothy in a minute. Mark chapter 4. That, that verse there in verse 11 in Hebrews 5 said that, that, that you are disinclined to listen. That was a line from a song by Simon and Garfunkel called The Boxer. And the story was talking about a, a, a young man who was going to go become a, a prize fighter, you know, and he was going to going to become a celebrity and so he he goes to the to the big city and finds out that you don't become a celebrity real real easily you know kind of like you go to New York or Los Angeles and think you're going to become a, a famous musician a rock star or something and you find out there's a little more to it than just you going and showing up and and in the in the song the the story was the the young boxer says um I've traded my existence for a pocket full of mumbles. Such are promises, all lies and jest. Still, a man, he hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. People like to hear what they want to hear. I recommend you get used to hearing what you don't want to hear. Because if you just hear what you want to hear, you're hearing lies and you're hearing a joke. That's right. That's right. 
Mark chapter 4, verse 24. Pay attention to what you hear. For by your own standard of measurement, that is, to the extent that you study spiritual truth and apply godly wisdom, it will be measured to you. And you will be given greater ability to respond. And more will be given to you besides. For whoever has a teachable heart to him will more understanding be given. And whoever does not have a yearning for the truth, even what he has will be taken away. Back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 3. Take with me your share of hardships like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Well, okay, what, what, what is this battle for truth? And, and what are we, uh, what, what does that struggle really mean for us in our lives in the here and now? Well, I can't speak for every person and what what every particular kind of temptation from the devil or every particular kind of trial or circumstance that you're going through, all of us have a different set of those. And it does say in 1 Corinthians that really, uh, you know, nobody is an island and everybody thinks, oh, I'm the only one that ever has to deal with this. But no, you're not. Everybody has to deal with satanic attack of some kind. But that said... The thing that we all better adjust our attitude toward is that we live in a world that is permeated with lies. I did not have sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. <laughs> Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Our state, Georgia, Arizona, did a thorough investigation of the, of the 2020 election and we found no irregularities. I could go on and on and on. You live in a world permeated with lies. It's like, how can you tell if a politician is lying? Is his lips moving? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 59. And I'm saying that's a battle. Why do, you, why do I say it's a battle? Because it's too easy to just sit there on the couch and watch the boob tube tell you these lies and you don't do anything. You don't resist it. Isaiah 59, verse 14. Justice is pushed back. And righteous behavior stands far away. The truth has fallen in the city square and integrity cannot enter. Yes, truth is missing and he who turns away from evil makes himself a prey. You see, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Now these words were written in 700 something B.C., but you know, there's something here that, that's interesting. He says, uh, truth is, is disappeared from uh, the city's forum. That's not a new thing, folks. You know, the, the, the image that uh, is, is the icon that is usually put to represent the, the justice system in America, right? It, it's lady, lady justice and she holds a scale over here and a scale over here, and she's blindfolded. And the thought is, well, justice is blind. No. Justice is not blind. God 
sees. And God wants us to see. You go into a, a court and you're, if you have to sit on a jury, the judge will instruct you, you can only decide based upon what evidence we give you in this courtroom. And that's wrong. You as a Christian, as a spirit-filled Christian, are supposed to decide according to what the Holy Spirit reveals to you. And the lawyer may not tell you something. You know, it may not come out in the, in the court. You know, they may not bring out that the person had a rap sheet this long that got killed by the police. Okay? But justice is not blind. Another thing, it talks about truth here. Well, what is truth? Well, you know... Um, Pilate asked that question. Keep the place here. Go to John chapter 18. I was thinking about this the other day when, on Friday night, a week or two ago, when Steve talked about this. And he kind of did an impression of Pilate. Two different ways. First he had Pilate kind of mocking Jesus. And then he had Pilate kind of befuddled. Well, I mean, it could have been a little of both, but it could have been something else. Well, let's read this. John chapter 18, verse 36. Chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus, this is Jesus before Pilate. He says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting hard to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate said to him, Then you're a king? And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I'm a king. This is why I was born. And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears and listens carefully to my voice. And then Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now, most biblical commentaries will say that he was doing that scornfully, that he was mocking Jesus. Well, I don't really think so. And I'll tell you why, because the rest of the verse goes on to say, when he said that, he went out to the Jews again and said, I find no fault in this man. He's not going to say that about somebody that he's mocking. He didn't understand Jesus. And he came, Jesus confronted him with something. Jesus confronted him with the fact he did not know the essence of what truth is. I mean, Jesus is the truth. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. He was looking right at the truth. He didn't know what he was looking at. Truth is not a casual thing. Truth is not just the circumstances. Truth is not just the facts. Truth is not just, well, this is what they tell you on TV, so we've got to go with that. Truth is the highest expression of what God does and is doing and has done. The word truth in the Old Testament, as it was used over here in Isaiah, that word is number 571. It means certainty, stability, trustworthiness. See, this is one of the things our world is losing. They're losing a sense of what is, what is real, what is stable, what, what can you take to the bank? You know, it's been a long time where, where it's like truth is relative. It's like, well, what's true for me might not be true for you. You know, I'm okay, you're okay. You go this way, I'll go that way. And, you know, nobody really knows the truth. 
Well, see, that was, that was the, the same mindset that a, a, a government leader would have had back then because he had been schooled in, in the Greek, what they call the Socratic, Socrates, Socratic method. And the Socratic method, and they still do this. In fact, you know I do this sometimes. It's you teach by asking a question. Okay, so Socrates would teach, well, what is uh, matter? Or what is uh, truth? Or what is air? <laughs> And then they would just, you know, go all kinds of places with that. And that was how they learned. That's how they taught physics. That's how they taught mathematics. That's how they taught everything, is you start by asking questions. In fact, that's how a little kid learns, right? Well, what is that? That's how you learn. Okay? So Pilate was asking a question. Pilate was just showing him. The fact is he was ignorant. He has a government official. And he was ignorant about what the truth is. What does that tell you about our life in this world today? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 1. Therefore... Since we have this ministry and we have received mercy from God, we do not become discouraged and lose our motivation. Man, if you are holding the truth, and we are holding a lot of truth here, <clears throat> don't get discouraged. You know, the devil tries to get me discouraged. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe I'm the only one. Okay? But you battle discouragement. When you have the truth, the devil is going to attack you. He's going to try to, well, what good does it do if you have the truth? I mean, you ain't got money, or you ain't got this, or, you know. Don't get discouraged. But we have renounced disgraceful things that which is hidden because of shame. And we're not walking in trickery or adulterating the Word of God. I hope I'm not. I'm trying hard not to. But by stating the truth openly and plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. It's like Owen used to say, truth has sticking power. That's what commending it to your conscience means. But even if our gospel is hid, in some sense, it's hidden only to those who are perishing, among whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving to prevent them from seeing the illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves merely as bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who has said, let light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory and majesty of God clearly revealed in the face of Christ. Well, I think I'm going to stop there because I said this is a series. This is, truth is out there. <laughs> no, I don't mean like the X-Files. I mean... Truth is something to be sought for. Truth is something to be treasured. You know, Jesus talked about, uh, you know, the pearl of great price or the treasure that was buried in the field. And when a man found it, he, he sold everything he had so he could have that. 
value the truth, the doctrine, the teaching, the revelation, the understanding that you have. Amen? So Father, thank You for that light of the Gospel of Jesus Christ that's in us. And thank You, Father, that since we have received that, that You have plans and purposes for us to pass that along to those who are ready to receive it. And that you